We're going to begin with our birth determines our, our, our identity. Why am I saying that? Well, let's, let's examine a few things in Scripture. Okay. First, we see that although Adam himself was created in whose image? God's image. We know that. Scripture tells us that, right? Although Adam was created in God's image, image, Genesis revealed that Adam's children, right, they were born in Adam's own image. Here's your reference. Let's look at Genesis 5, verses 1, 2, and 3. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. Verse 2. He created them male and female, and he blessed them. And when they were created, he called them man. And in parentheses, he's referring to Adam and Eve. Verse 3, key verse. But when Adam lived 130 years, he had a son in his own likeness, in his own image. Now, I'm going to challenge some thinking here. God is a spirit. Are we correct about that? He's a spirit. So when Adam was created, he was created first and foremost a spirit. That's how he was able to communicate with God. He had to be a spirit. He had a soul. He lived in the body. When Adam ate of that tree, what did the Lord tell him if he would eat of that tree? He would surely die. Why did it take Adam 900 and some years to die? I think it was around 930 to be exact. What happened? Did he die 930 years or did he die instantly? What happened? He actually died spiritually. That's what we're going to examine. The distinction is very clear. Adam was made in the likeness of God. He wasn't born. He was made. See the play on words? But Adam's sons were born in Adam's own likeness. We just read that, Genesis 5, 3. And then the Bible repeats, in his image, whose image? Adam's image and his own likeness. Now, according to Scripture, are we born in the image of God? We've always been taught that. We're born in the image of God. While Scripture says Adam was made, he wasn't born. The Scripture tells us that after salvation, after salvation didn't take place until Jesus made salvation available. I'm talking about being redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. So this is the whole Old Testament. After salvation, the finished work of Calvary's cross, Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, because it's his resurrection that gives us eternal life, and it is our justification. That's Romans 4.25, if you need a reference. We have been recreated after salvation in Christ Jesus. What's been recreated? The spirit man. Now, in Adam, that spirit man died, but was he still there is the question. He was. Adam's sin caused his spirit to be sold as a slave to the power of sin. Sin entered the world, and death entered the world through sin. So this power called sin, sin being a noun, this sin was also the sin that the Lord warned Cain about, that sin was crouching at his door, and its desires, it's not talking about Cain's desires, but sin's desires, so he personalized it. Sin has desire, and its desire is to master you, but you must master it, is what scripture says. That's what the Lord told him. So the first mention of the word sin in the Bible comes from that account in Genesis 4 with Cain and Abel. And the Lord tells us something very important about sin. It's a power that wants to dominate us because your spirit man has been sold as a slave to sin. So all of the Old Testament, all of it, even reading the Gospels because they were born under law, no one was redeemed yet. And everyone born even after the cross is born in the Adam's family. We were all born in the Adam's family by birth. We weren't made that way um, because of our own doing, but by Adam's disobedience, we were made sinners, Romans 5.19. We read in Colossians 3.10, we have put on the new self. What new self? Spirit man, which implies it was an old self. The old self, Romans 6, that the old man was crucified. That old man was the old spirit man. So we have put on this new self who was being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one. Who's the one? Christ Jesus, who created him, who created this new spirit man that's in you. That's the born again. That's why you have to be born again. There's a natural birth and there is a spiritual rebirth. Now, with respects to our beginnings, our origins, we are all, like I said earlier, descendants of Adam, the first man. Anyone here came from a mother and father? No one's uh, immaculate uh, conception here? <laughs> so if your father wasn't around, nor would you be around. Or your great-grandfather, mom and dad may not be around. At natural birth, we bear and we convey Adam's image, the way we walk, the way we demonstrate life. We walk and we produce his kind of lifestyle. A child of the earliest age, selfishness just comes right out, right? Just, I can just picture it now. 
By one man's disobedience, what one man? Adam. Adam's spiritual death caused what? All of his descendants, all of humanity. They didn't miss a one because it all came from him. It caused all of humanity to be born spiritually dead. Adam's sin brought a couple of things in. We see in Romans 5, 18, it brought in condemnation to all of us. All of us before salvation. Let's make sure we see it, right? Before salvation, we were born into this condemnation. Adam's sin made, us, made all mankind sinners, Romans 5, 19. Adam's sin earned each of us this heavyweight title called sinner. So let's briefly just analyze Romans 5, 18 and 19. So then, as through one transgression, whose transgression? I always like to ask those things. Adam, since there is in parentheses, Adam, there resulted in condemnation to some men. No, all, all. Seriously, he didn't miss a beat. We all got it. I could say unfair. I didn't do it, but he did it. And even so, through the one act of righteousness, there resulted justification of life to all men. In this chapter, it can be easily taken out of context because it has. That's why we have this cult called universalism. They look at these things to see, look, we're all righteous. We're all justified. No, you read everything in this context. You have to receive. You have to believe. Okay, no one's born into this. You know, no one just just credited. The Lord doesn't just come up and say, yeah, you know, I don't care what you believe, see, or do. Everyone's saved. No, it's not the way it works. Verse 19, for through the one man's disobedience, who? Adam, not mine, and not yours. We're analyzing the context. Because of Adam's disobedience, many, which is the word all, were made sinners. And even through the obedience of the one Jesus, his obedience, not ours, many will be made righteous. This is all through salvation. All of mankind, whether you're Jew or Gentile, which is what the earlier chapters of Romans is establishing, are all under, are all under the power of sin. Our spiritual dead state originated from being born, as I said earlier, in the Adam family. Not from what we've done, which is in the past, or what we're doing, even in the present. It's because of Adam's disobedience we were born in that spiritually dead state. We could try through our self-discipline. I might be stepping on some toes here. Through our Christ-like behavior, we can imitate Jesus. What would Jesus do? That's why I said I'm stepping on some toes. But none of those attempts could ever place us in Jesus' spiritual bloodline. Scripture says you have to receive his justification, what he's done by grace through faith. You and I are who we are by birth. We're not who we are by behavior. The world may judge us by our behavior, but we are who we are by birth. That's the truth. Is behavior important? Yes. And we're going to get there. We're going to talk about that. But the true identity in you is your spirit man. And if your spirit man is born dead, sold as a slave to the power of sin, he can imitate Christ all he wants. It's not going to get him saved. He's got to believe. He's got to be born again. Jesus provided a death for you. He provided a burial for you. He provided a resurrection for you so that your old spirit man could be crucified, buried, raised up with his righteousness, his holiness, justified because before you were ungodly. And God justified the ungodly when he sent his son and demonstrated his love. And so once you've received this, God does this divine exchange in your spirit man. So you'll find out who you really are. Your true identity is you are now the new holies of holies with no veil. The veil was his flesh. And as we saw in last week, as we looked at that film and we reanalyzed Acts 15, out of the mouth of James, Jesus' brother, he said this speaks of the tabernacle of David. You know what the tabernacle of David is? If you looked over 2 Samuel 6, David went back and got the ark. And when he finally brought it back, he set up a tent. Guess what? No holy place, no most holy place, none of those things. Everyone came and worshipped. That prophecy of where we are today, the veil was torn in half by unseen hands when Christ gave up his spirit. That veil was his flesh. And when he gave it up, he tore it in half and said, enter it in. It is finished. We can't enter into a new covenant unless blood is spilt. When we read the Bible and we see Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the text, and we see the page before, it says Matthew, and it says, new covenant, that is not the beginning of the New Testament. For the book's purposes, it identifies the separation of books and chapters and stuff. But when Christ gave up his body, gave up his life, poured out his blood, it was because of the shedding of his blood how we were, a we were able to enter into the covenant. The gospel truth is this, that our Heavenly Father has made it possible for all mankind. He has made it possible. He's not forcing mankind. He's demonstrated his love. Man's lo men and women's lives are being transformed by the hope of the calling that he's given us by the finished work of Christ. And when people see a man or a woman whose life's been transformed by what Christ has done, giving witness, 
being a witness, not doing witnesses, just telling their story and walking out this life of a transformed life. And especially if people knew how they were. You know, the, the world's going to say, oh, they just found God because they fell on hard times. But when they know that they know that this must be God because this is not the person I once knew, it's a witness. It's a witness. So God has made it possible for all of mankind to have this gospel truth, to exchange our spiritually dead nature that we got from Adam for God's spiritually living nature. When you get his new spirit, in you, a new spirit, and his spirit in you, you get his new nature. You get his desires. You may not know what they are yet because you still have the flesh's way of thinking. When we begin to realize and understand that it's all about birth, it's not about behavior. Yes, behavior is important, but it's about birth. That's the whole com conversation with Nicodemus. You must be born again. There's a natural birth, and then there's a spiritual birth. So it's about birth, not behavior. When we get this understanding and we realize this, especially it becomes revelation, not information. You know what? This mixed gospel message that we're always concerned with performance, guess what? That's going to be removed because you know it's about what Christ has done. And then your boasting will be in what Christ has done, not on your effort. You'll have efforts, but those efforts will be motivated by the love that's within you, operating because of the life that's in you. That's the key, that the life that's in you is producing fruit, not you trying to practice this fruit because that's willpower. The phrase, you must be born again, has been abused, especially by the religious, has been stated so many times with its religious demands that many have lost sight of its true meaning. And now, it truly makes sense when you think about what Jesus meant by being born again. The old spirit man who was sold as a slave to sin, he can't come out unless he believes on Christ who gives him a new spirit man, who gives him new desires, who frees him from this power of sin. And guess where this power of sin lives? In your body. So even when you are given a new spirit man, that power of sin still lives within you. He's the one that's constantly trying to tempt you. And when the law is introduced to this power of sin who lives in you, guess what? The power of sin looks for opportunity to deceive you. But when you think that it's you and your sinful nature that's deceiving you, you're looking at the wrong source. It's the power of sin and the old way of thinking, flesh, that are getting together like a tag team and putting a whooping on you because you don't know who you are. Because we are all born from Adam's descendants, the first Adam, that's where this whole confusion starts. Our spiritual bloodline was tied to Adam's spiritual dead nature. His spiritual dead nature came from his spirit. The spirit had this sin nature, not you. Because when he died, he died as well. Remember, Jesus told Nicodemus that each human being's real need is to be born a second time. That was it. He got right to the chase with him. The real need is that you must be born a second time. And of course, he went into the natural. Jesus said, you don't get it. You were sold as a slave to sin. You didn't get it. Jesus wasn't coaxing him. He wasn't advocating to Nicodemus. Hey, Nick, uh, you need to turn over a new leaf in life. You got to try harder. You know what? Polish up your act. Jesus was not telling him to perform better. But that's what we've been taught. Perform better. You must do better. You got to do things for God. God needs you to help him. God came to minister to you. And when you've been delivered and healed, you'll become a witness. And it'll be easy to witness and do all the things that he wants you to do because you'll be motivated by his love, life, and spirit within you. You need to receive healing first before you go out giving medicine. Don't give out prescriptions you haven't taken yet. I know that because I speak that from personal experience. So a little bit about me. I came from this background of brokenness, religiosity, performance-minded, the abuse of you must be born again. I've been there trying to turn over a new leaf. I was doing all these things that Jesus was not telling Nick to do because I was taught it. And I believed it because, you know, we live in a world that's merit-based, meritocracy. We always want to perform. And so we mix that with our belief system because our conscience is sin consciousness. It's always concerned with the next sin. I better not blow it. I better not blow it. And so we're so aware of our sin, and should I say our sin name, actions. The handout that I gave you, you'll see three columns. You notice the word sin there. Do you see it? I want you to notice in column one, it says sin now. What number do you see there, class? So everywhere you see in the New Testament, the word sin, this is everywhere in the New Testament, everywhere in the New Testament. Where the word sin noun, 266, is at, in the exact book order. The next column in the middle was the verb, 264. And the last column to the right is the adjective. Remember first class, what is a noun, what is a verb, what is an adjective? Noun is a person, place, or thing. Verb is the action. What does the adjective do? It describes the noun. Example, that's a wall. What color is the wall? Blue. I described it. So the adjective is blue, the wall is the noun. My talking is the action. Clarification? I know sometimes I need to go back and do something simple, but when I realized that Jesus died for sin, the noun, one scripture that became a life source to me was 2 Corinthians 5.21. It's on here. 2 Corinthians 5.21, sin is a noun. And it says, 
For he made him to be sin, the noun, for us, who knew no sin, now, not sinning, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. I'm so concerned with actions, not realizing Jesus paid the penalty of this sin to free us from it. God took out his holy judgment on sin on the body of his son, and he endured it all and cried out as finished when God exhausted his judgment on sin. He didn't punish his son. Jesus endured it like a lightning rod and sucked it all up until there was nothing left to endure, and it was over. He said, it's finished. Because when he went down to hell, he didn't, he didn't go to hell to get punished. He took the keys, and he went around hell. You'll read this in Colossians. He went around hell sh shouting the triumph that we have and was raised up victorious with our righteousness. Giving, that's a free gift. It's amazing. I know I'm giving you a lot in a little bit, a little bit of time, and we're not even really covering a lot of time, so let me keep it moving. Instead, this whole thing, Jesus was dressing the heart of the matter. It's about birth. You have natural birth. You have spiritual birth. Some regard Christianity as a behavior improvement program. All dressed up in religious clothes. I'm serious. I work in a jail. I know a lot of people that their family goes to jail. Uh, their members go to church and they find the Lord. And all they'll say, oh, it took them to go to jail to find Jesus. They found Jesus or Jesus found them. Rejoice. Never mind. <laughs> okay. Yet Jesus has revealed that God's plan was actually about exchange of nature. An old dead spirit nature sold as a slave to the bondage of sin, to a new spirit man who's no longer slaves to the power of sin. He's free. Sin no longer has dominion over him. That's what Romans 6.14 tells us. So, as I said earlier, you are a spirit. You, are, you have a soul. You live in a body. And that all equals you. That's right. And let me repeat it again. You are a spirit. That's who you are, your identity. You have a soul. That's where your will, your mind, your emotions is at. You live in that suit called the body. So here is a little, here's a little graph that we'll be adding to as classes go on. The smallest man in this picture, your spirit. But before you were born again, you were born in the Adams family, your spirit was sold as a slave to the power of sin. Your soul is not who you are, but you have a soul where your will and your emotions are at. And of course, you live in a body. We're going to keep adding to this graph after we go week after week. You're going to see some important truths. Romans 5, verses 6 to 21. For while we were still helpless, helpless? Paul was helpless? Yeah, we were all helpless because we were born in Adam. Make sense? For when we were still helpless, at the right time, what did Christ do? He died for the godly. No, 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 I see. UN. He died for the ungodly because there is no godly. There is no righteous. Verse 7. For one would hardly die for a righteous man. Guess what? There is no righteous, but this is just trivial. Though perhaps for a good man, someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrated his own agape love. You look across, it's agape. His agape love, what? Toward us. The toward us who were help, who were helpless. The context. We were helpless. He demonstrated his love toward the ungodly, toward the helpless, while we were still yet sinners. Christ died for us. The us, he died for the ungodly. Again, there is no godly. Oh, there it is. Romans chapter 3, verses 9 and 10, a reference to that. And what do we read in Romans 3, 9 and 10? Basically, both Jew and Greek, doesn't matter, all are under sin. If you look on your sheet now, as it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. Now, I'm going to, just for the sake of having some fun, I want to show you in the Amplified Bible how that reads. Well then, are we Jews superior and better off than they, that they is the Gentiles? No, not at all. We have already charged that all men, all men, both Jew and Gentiles, the context, are under sin, held down by and subjected to its power and control. That's not your actions. Your old spirit man, because you're born again, was subject to, and people you know that aren't saved, and people that you know are struggling their identity in Christ that are saved don't know this truth. They've been delivered. Those who haven't been delivered need a rebirth. The importance of that rebirth is your independence, your declaration of independence. You've got to be given a new spirit to be declared free. Romans, the entire book, is your emancipation of proclamation. It's your declaration of independence. If you don't know that, you'll struggle with your identity. It's a powerful book. Verse 9, much more than... Now, there's, these much mores are very serious, so I can't really exhaust all of Romans 5 in this brief time, but I'm going to give you the meat, though. When it says much more, it's comparing itself to something that's much less. Much more than having now been justified. Declared righteous is what it means. Now, you've been declared righteous by what? His blood. Whose blood? My blood? Your blood? Jesus' blood. 
So you've been declared righteous by his blood that we who were the ungodly, who were helpless, shall be saved. Look, we're saved from an angry God. We're saved from his wrath. So when people say, oh, God, oh, yes, God's a God of love, but he's a God of wrath. No, scripture never describes him as wrath. However, guess what? We're saved from his wrath. So stop preaching God's a God of wrath. You need to tell people that God is a God of love and what he's done demonstrating his love. Verse 10, for if while we were enemies, see, look, we were helpless, but we were also his enemies. That was before salvation. For if while we were enemies, we were, look, reconciled to God. He did the reconciling through what? The death of his son, the blood of his son brought new covenant in. Much more, another much more, having been reconciled. So he's saying, hey, not only that, but look, I'm going to tell you some more good stuff. You know that phrase, not, hey, not only that, he's giving you some not only that. He's just giving you some good stuff. Having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So here's something important. Jesus' death provides the forgiveness. The life provides the victory and fruit in your life. Without the resurrection, we're a bunch of fools following a dead man. And not only this, see, I know that he's just adding them on. It's just getting better. And not only this, but we also exalt. The word exalt by, I know it's real small on the screen, but I can read it. Because I'm like a whole lot closer. Guess what it says? No. Exalt says to boast. Where is your boasting? Remember in your works? Guess what? Your boasting's in Christ. Your boasting's in this finished work, this death and resurrection of Christ, this new covenant that we have. So I can take that word boast and substitute it for exalt and say, and not only this, but we boast in God through our Lord. We got confidence in him. We boast in our God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we, who were helpless, who were ungodly, have now received. Received what? We received reconciliation. You have peace with God. You've been declared righteous by his death and resurrection. He's given you a new spirit. Your dead old spirit man is gone. Well, how sin and death entered the world, we briefly kind of discovered that a little earlier. And therefore, therefore is therefore because of what we just read earlier. Therefore, just as through the one man, the power of sin, that's sin the noun. Here is the number, 266. Therefore, because of Adam, the power of sin entered the world, and guess what? And death came through this power of sin. And so this death spread to all men because all sinned. Well, guess what? Because they have this dead spirit man. You're not a sinner because you sin. You're a sinner because of Adam's sin. That's why you sin. Action. Identity. Verse 13. For until the law, the power of sin was in the world. So it was here. It was still here. There was no law. But you know what the law did? It pulled it out of every human being. It showed you you had sin in you. It brought it out. It was that injection that brought the disease out. For until the law, sin, the power of sin was in the world. But sin is not imputed when there is no law. But nevertheless, death reigned. That word reign reigned like a king. Death reigned like a king. It's got its crown on and saying, hey, this is my kingdom. Okay? Death reigned. Hey, check it out. From Adam until Moses. Why say Moses? Because that's when the law came in. Even over those who had not sinned, that's action, like Adam did in his offense. But no matter what, it was his birth that gave him that identity, and that's why they sinned. And Adam, who was a type of him, who was to come. So Adam is a type of Christ. He's not Christ. He's the first man, not the last man. And the last man is something much greater. Verse 15. But the free gift. What free gift? Let's see. Context tells what the gift is. But the free gift is not like the transgression, which is the sin that came in. For if by the transgression of the one... For by the sin of Adam, many died spiritually. They died, all born spiritually dead. Much more, the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ has grace. He is grace. So it's the grace of God and the grace of Jesus. Very interesting, right? Abound to many. That word abound means to be over and above. In other words, you got a cup, you turn on the water, and it reaches to the top, you turn it off, that abounds. 
But if you don't turn it off, it spills over. That's the type of grace we're talking about, overflowing grace. Verse 16, we're still talking about the gift. The gift is not like that which came through Adam, through the one, who sinned by his action. He sinned, his disobedience. For on the one hand, remember condemnation? Now we got judgment. Judgment arose from his sin, from his transgression. And it resulted in what? Condemnation. So there it is. But on the other hand, the free gift arose from many sins. This free gift came from the sins. And it resulted in being declared righteous, justification. Because of what Jesus did. He paid the price for our sin. He paid a debt he did not owe. So that we can receive a gift we did not deserve. And we're still trying to find out what that gift is. Verse 17. For if by the transgression of the one, the one is Adam, death reigned like a king through the one. Much more, those who receive, those who receive me, it implies someone has to receive this gift. Receive what? They have to receive two things. The abundance of grace, that's gift number one, and the gift of righteousness. This is God's very own righteousness. Is what the book of Romans goes on to tell us. It's about God's gift of righteousness, not man working up to be right and just and innocent before God because he cannot be perfectly perfect all the time. The minute he flunks in one, he flunked in all. So again, two gifts, the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. Check it out. When you receive them, you will reign, not in the afterlife, but in this life through the one, Jesus Christ. No longer in the Adam's family, you're in the Jesus family. So then, as through the one transgression, it resulted in condemnation to all. Even so, through one act of righteousness, it wasn't our act, it was Jesus' act. It resulted in what? Justification of life. Not death, life. And we reign in this life to all men who receive. You have to receive. Verse 19. For as through the one man's disobedience, again, Adam's disobedience. Many were made sinners. That is an adjective, not a noun. It's describing us. Like blue, it's describing us when it says the word sinner. Even so, through the obedience of the one, Jesus, many will be made righteous. And that righteous is a noun. So it's real. It's not describing the color of you. Verse 20. The law came in so that transgressions, in layman's terms, sins. The law came in so that sin would increase. What? Did I just read that right? Yes. The law came in so that sin would increase. Transgressions would, would increase. Because it says, but where sin increased. See, I didn't make that up. It said, where sin increased, where transgressions increased, grace abounded all the more. Well, what does it say over here about this word abound? Hmm, interesting. It's super parisio, which means it abounds much more exceedingly. And when you read this out and you find out what it means, it means to run over, spill over, you can't exhaust it. It's crazy abounding versus the other abounding. It's, it's huge. Verse 21. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign through righteousness. It doesn't reign through death. It reigns through the gift of righteousness. Christ's gift of righteousness to you, to eternal life. When he gives you his spirit, his spirit is eternal. He lives in you. Guess what he's given you? Eternal life. He promises never to leave you or forsake you. You have eternal life. It's not a coin you're going to lose one day and look for it in the house. He's taken up residence in you. You have this eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So here's a condensed version of everything we just went over. Because of Adam's disobedience, verse 12 says, Through Adam's one transgression, the power of sin and death spread to all men. And in verse 15, it says, By Adam's one transgression, many died. Verse 16 says that judgment came from Adam's one transgression, which brought about condemnation. Verse 17 tells us that by Adam's one transgression, the power of death reigned. Not only the power of sin, but the power of death. Verse 18 says that by Adam's one transgression, all men were placed under condemnation. Verse 19 says by Adam's disobedience, all men were made sinners. Verse 20 the law came in so that transgressions would increase, and also the power of sin reigns in death. Now that I just gave you the bad news, let me cheer you up with some good news. The gospel, the truths of the gospel. We read in the same context, verse 15 says, because of Jesus' obedience, 
God's grace and free gift of righteousness came by Jesus Christ. Verse 16, the free gift of righteousness is not like the power of sin and death, which came from Adam who sinned. For out of many transgressions, the free gift of righteousness brought justification. Verse 17 says, Jesus brought in two free gifts. The abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. Verse 18 says, By Jesus' one act of righteousness, it resulted in justification of life to all men who receive. 19 says, By Jesus' obedience, many men will be made righteous. Verse 20, Where the power of sin increased, grace super increases. And verse 21, Grace reigns through the free gift of righteousness in the eternal life of Jesus Christ. So I hope and pray that this chapter stirs your spirit. There is so much abundance in this gospel. Receive and never stop receiving from him. Because from the overflow of receiving, you're going to spill over and minister to others. When I, when I share these things with you, it's a reminder of what he's done to me and continually does. Because I'm not perfect, but I'm not the person I once was. The person who was in bondage to the things that he was doing, I, am, I know this is the grace of God because I didn't get me here. What I was in bondage to and how he freed me, overnight. You'll find out about that next week. Stay tuned. Next channel. Next, <laughs> next bad channel. But how he did it shocked me. Because when, the thought of the temptation, when that temptation thought came, the desire was gone. That's what shocked me. Mm. It was like a magnet. When you put a magnet on metal and you feel that pull, when the thought used to come, I felt that magnetic pull. When the thought came after the Lord gave me this revelation I'm going to give you next week, Done. Overnight, the next day, I knew something had happened. I knew something happened. And it's been several years now. And now the Lord is allowing me open doors to share this with everyone. So I pray that tonight was just a start of diving in. As you see me, I'm meticulous. I give you a lot, but I want you to have a lot. Not to be overwhelmed. So the Lord can minister to you too. It's my concern. Any questions before we go? God bless you all. Thank you very much. Okay? All right.